how much of the accomplishments of high level CrossFit Games athletes can be attributed to the coach and how much of it is virtuosity on the part of the athlete? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, no one knows. That's like, I don't know. Um, <laughs> you, don't, you don't have a percentage for us? <laughs> I, I, so I, I guess maybe the question is, um, do coaches have a major influence yeah. in the performance of athletes? Yeah. yeah, sure. It depends on the coach and depends on the athlete. If you have a really knowledgeable, really good coach with a really humble, really coachable athlete, of course. That's like, but it's not, co it's not the sport of CrossFit specific. It's not even athletics. Yeah. It's like any... Um, coach, it's a mentor mentee relationship. And then the opposite is also true. If you have a crappy coach and a person that are things that you already figured out, that's not going to move the needle probably at all. We are here because we know the outcomes in our lives are within our control. That taking absolute ownership of how we eat, sleep, train, think, and connect with each other is how we'll optimize our health and happiness. That chasing excellence is how we grab hold of what is possible. Our mission is to Five, live on the run, four, always three, chasing, two, never one, stopping. Go. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Chasing Excellence. Today, we are back at a two-minute drill. Um, for those folks who are new, two-minute drills are when um, uh, listeners send me questions that they would love to uh, hear us address. Um, so I present them to you, and you attempt to an answer them within two minutes. The shot clock is on. Shot clock. Um, and as always, the questions are random, but well within the, the scope of what we usually talk about here. So we're going to dive into it straight away with the first question. Thoughts on it's better to ask for forgiveness than permission. Um, well... I would actually rather have to ask for neither. Mm. Um, I think that the idea behind that is if it's, so maybe it's a cop-out answer, Yeah, but that's truly the way I think about that is if you're in a position where you have to think about that, I'm, I'm a big believer in as no one, anyone that's um, listened to the podcast before is these principles is let's not solve a problem once. Let's create a principle that will solve this for everything going forward. So um, the issue there is lack of clarity, lack mm -hmm. of communication. You're unsure about something. So the question is, should I go and have a discussion beforehand of whether I should go pursue this or not? Or should I just go ahead and do it not knowing? And then, um, if it was wrong, ask for permission afterwards. Yeah. The, the issue there is lack of communication. Yeah. we have a principle, which is ABC, which is always be communicating. And we have a lot of, um, kind of underpinnings of what that actually means. So the, the, the bigger issue there, which I'm always looking for that is improve the clarity of what is acceptable behavior, um, standards, um, what is the, uh, behaviors you're looking for. And then you don't need to think about permission or for forgiveness. Yeah. If I had to pull out one of them, I would say forgiveness. Cause I want somebody that's a go getter. Mm -hmm. I would rather have somebody just like go and do it and then make a mistake. And we learn from that mistake rather than constantly waiting, waiting and waiting, dude. It's like, it's your turn. Go. Yeah, totally. Um, next question. How do you handle or deal with people who are toxic and chronically problematic, whether that might be a member, neighbor, family member, whatever? Yeah, this is, uh, I, I um, love it. So you only have so much power. Call that energy. Call that time. Like these finite resources that are you make up who Patrick is. If you're giving up your power your, your resources to somebody that is toxic, mm -hmm. whether that's a work environment, um, um, one of your friends, or even a family member, here's a really hard thing that I actually believe in. If you have a, some people live in this world where they're, they have a parent who is toxic, mm -hmm. or some people might have put themselves in a bad position where they have a spouse who is toxic. What I would do in that situation is truly um, put as much as I can into correcting the situation. And if I have exhausted every available resource that I have, and it becomes to the point where this person is just a leech sucking my energy, I would move, move on from that relationship. Yeah. It is a toxic relationship that is spoiling who you are as a human being. You cannot, this is one of the most important things, you cannot surround yourself with bad people. You have to, I mean, we talk about this all the time. It is environment. Environment above all, above your own willpower, environment matters more. Well, what is more 
um, transferable. What is it? What creates the environment more than, the than these than people around it? So you have to remove those people from your surroundings. Now, there's tactful ways to do that. Yeah. And there's tactful ways to go about trying to improve that person. So I'm not saying like, Someone said something mean to you, move on. Like right. You have to do this in the appropriate fashion. But the bottom line message is, if you decide that that person is toxic and they are not going to change, remove yourself. Just out of curiosity, do you have a, a, an easy definition for what toxic actually is? Because that's that feels to me... There's there's probably some gray area there, yeah. but I'm wondering where you would you would draw the line into or or the line would be okay we've we've crossed over and now we're we've entered into toxic. Yeah, there's there's other people that have defined this better than I have, so yeah. I'll try to like uh, like steal from that. Steal, yeah, basically, <laughs> and I'm not going to do it well. But there's um there's basically like ugh, I wish I could use the term, but there's like um there there's basically. There's fountains and then there's holes. Like, mm. are they filling up your bucket or are they draining it, right? It's that idea of like, if someone is constantly draining your energy, that's a toxic person. It doesn't mean to be that like they are, they use four letter words and they swear. Yep. Right. It doesn't mean to be that they have substance abuse problems or that they're phys or physically or verbally abusive. It's literally just like when you are around them, do they drain you? Mm -hmm. Do they drain your energy? Do they drain your mood? Are they a negative influence on your life? And then the opposite is the positive. Okay. Next question. How do you and Ben retain information from the books you read and listen to? Do you take notes? Do you reread them? Uh, reread the books that stand out? I'm trying to read more um, and and curious how you guys synthesize and utilize the information. Okay, so I'd love to hear your take on this too because the question is to both of us. Um, but what I do is, um, so the first thing is, I'm really, um, I'm an auditory learner. Yeah. So I, I, when somebody um, speaks to me, I remember things fairly well. Mm. Um, so I do a lot of audiobooks. So I'm able to read a lot because I don't read. Yeah. <laughs> I, can, I can listen faster than I can read. And what I'll do is I'll listen to it on 1.5 speed because mm -hmm. a book, you can do that. A podcast like we, like we do, it, it's the, the talk is too fast. But right. a book, they purposely talk very slowly so you can absorb the information. Yeah. What I'll do is I'll listen to it at 1.5 speed. And if I really, um, so then from there, I do two things to help me retain it. I want to get through things. And first, it's, it's like the litmus test of, is this worth listening to? So I'll listen to it, and if it's really good, right then I will um, rewind, and I will listen to certain sections, paragraphs, chapters, whatever it might be, over again. And if I really like it, I'll stop my car, pull over, literally, because I do most of this in the car. I'll literally pull over the car, and I'll write down in notes, and I'll dictate it into my notes. And then... I will constantly be going through my notes and rereading those things all the time. And I'll actually use that information to create presentations. So all the entire time, the, the, the end of this is the whole time I'm learning, listening or reading, whether that's notes and dog earing or rereading things or whatever it might be. I'm constantly asking myself, is this something worth me learning? And if it is, I need to know it enough that I can re-disseminate the information. Right. So that I'm constantly putting through the litmus test, through that filter of, do I want to be able to own this? Do I want to be able to own this? Do I want to be able to own this? And I have a podcast. Mm -hmm. I coach coaches. I coach members. I'm a dad. I have seminars that I do. So I'm constantly in this position of disseminating information. Right. I'm always filtering it through that. So. Love to hear your take because you have some similarities, yeah. uh, but some differences as well, I'm sure. Totally. Yeah. I mean, it's something that I've thought about a lot because I, I found myself in, in years past, we've talked about this a little bit, um, kind of reading for the satisfaction of knowing that I've read it yeah, without... Right. You're doing it for the dope response right, of checking of like, the box. Okay, I read book. that book and I read that. Okay, I read right. the, late, the latest Simon Sinek and I read the latest you know, Adam Grant. Yeah. And so I've thought a lot about how, how to get out of that habit. And so it, one thing that I would say is like, I love the idea that, that you get it through auditory because I don't like mm. I, I actually zone out when I listen to just one voice talking, mm. um, like even Seth Godin's podcast, which is like, I, I would do anything that Seth Godin, but I can't listen to his podcast because it's just him yeah. talking and, and like just my brain goes. Yeah. And so I need, so all that to say, like, I need to be active while I'm reading it. 
Um, and so I always read paper books. I, I tried the Kindle thing. Like I love the idea yeah. of it, but I just can't do it. I need a piece of paper and, and a pen. As do I. Yeah, like clearly. All the books, the books um, and us. so like that's that's one part of it is just being really as active as you can while you're reading. And that could just be highlighting, underlining, making, uh, you know, it's called marginalia, which is like little notes in the margins. Um, but then I even, love when you put a name to it, how it sounds smart. It's yeah. <laughs> really, it's yeah. marginalia, marginalia, which, or scribbles. Yeah. Scribble uh, either one's, one's fine. fine. Scribble. So, on so I've done that for a long time. And even that's not enough. Cause like a book, what's a book? 300 pages, like underlining some things and then that's it. That's still not going right. to do much. So I've actually come into something relatively recently and I'm, I'm actually really excited about it. And it's kind of why I like this question. And it's something from Ryan Holiday. Um, and he didn't invent it, but he's just somebody I pay attention to. And he talks about this a lot. And it's called, um, uh, it's called a commonplace book. Um, and it's just like, it's like an old thing where it's basically just like a notebook or a place yeah. um, in the same way that you just said, like notes. notes yep. um, and what it is, is uh, it's just a place where you can re-engage with the ideas, right? And so one thing, one thing that I do is... I try to read every day. I try to read like 20, like this is another thing, Adam Grant, um, who wrote uh, Originals and Give and Take. Uh, no, actually, I'm sorry, it's James Clear, The Habit, uh, Atomic oh, Habits. Yep. He said the one habit that he can, um, that stuck with him as it relates to reading more was just committing to reading 20 pages a day, um, which is a lot, but not that much. Like you can do it. You can do it in 30 minutes or something. Yeah. Um, and so all that to say, I try to read 20 pages every day in the morning. Except on Mondays and Thursdays, I go back through everything that I've read cool. or I've listened to as a podcast or I've come across in a magazine. So you're reading your yes. book. Yes. Your notes. And so on Monday and Thursday, instead of reading, I go through and I literally just go through the, the books and the highlights. And like I just did it with a, a Gary V a Gary V podcast, kind of the same way where if I'm listening to a podcast, because oftentimes I'm in the car, I'll just note, I'll just write down like the time code, like at 7.30, something, he said something interesting. So then on the Monday and Thursday, I'll go back and I'll go, I'll kind of scrub through the podcast and I'll say, okay, what was that thing that I was looking for? And then I'll enter it into, I have a, I use an app called Notion. Um, and I just have a document in inside of that app that is literally just a collection of these highlights, these ideas, cool. categorized by some higher level categories, like, marketing or leadership or entrepreneurship or parenting or betterment or health or whatever. Um, so th my point being for me, I can't just read it and it doesn't, it doesn't stick. It only sticks when I read it and then engage with it in some kind of way. Nice. That's my own three minute, two minute answer. Next question. Cheat meals once a week, once a month or never. It's cheating. <laughs> like it's called a cheat meal. You're yeah. cheating. I believe that if you have a sustainable, um, so I think cheat meals are good for people that are, are, are dieting people that are like doing something that's not sustainable. So you're doing some crazy caloric deficit. You're doing some macros that you yep. can't sustain to like in that case, yes, it's a mental and physical reprieve from this thing that you're not gonna be able to do forever. Yep. I, I just don't love the extremes. Yeah. I'm a much bigger fan of, um, eating real food, not too much, mostly plants all the time. And then I get it. Like, um, if you need a break from the practice because you, for whatever reason, like I, I get it, do it, go ahead and do it. Yeah. But I don't like this idea of like, um, 80, 20, even because 80, 20 gets skewed. I'm just, I'm not a huge advocate of, you know, every Saturday night you go yeah. for the ice cream and the, the big thing. Yeah. Um, you know, I get it. If it, if it, it's the thing that keeps you on track, rock and roll and go for it. Yeah. But to me as, um, just a practice, I would reevaluate the practice as a whole. Do you follow the rock on Instagram? I know the rock does. I'm huge. <laughs> I don't, he was one celebrity I followed for a while. Yeah. Okay. I know so he does know. big. Yeah. yeah. He's, he's kind of crazy. All right. Next question. What are some tips and tricks on safely gaining weight? Sometimes I eat so much. I feel sick. Okay. So I've worked with some athletes that this is a, this is a big thing. It's a big struggle. Yeah. Um, they're trying to put on mass. They're trying to put on weight and they're hard gainers. Yeah. It's like, you know, they're, um, they have a really hard time. Even no matter what they do, they can't get above 8% body fat. And it's like, everyone's listening is like, damn, those people. <laughs> yeah. Um, and they're trying to put on weight. So here's the things that we've tried and things that have not worked well. We've done everything from like a, a jar of peanut butter a day Ooh, yeah. um, on top of all the regular yep. food you eat. Um, a gallon, go mad, gallon milk, yep. a gallon of milk a day. Um, both of those things, um, uh, created 
really pro-inflammatory states. So yeah. they the, the people um, had a hard time training mm. um, because if you have the littlest bit of lactose intolerant, you do that, it's right. really tough. Yeah. It, if yeah. you have a little bit of um, the legume thing from peanuts, it's like really, really tough. It amplifies it yeah. with that much. Yeah. So here's my take on this is if you're gaining weight and you're having a hard time because you... Um, the one thing that has kind of worked is just eat your um, regular stuff. Just eat a little bit. Here's the bottom line is you need more calories. Yeah. Period. You need more calories. So what you need to do is get towards more calorie dense foods. So fruits and veggies are not the best option. They're still get them for sure. You need the micronutrients, but you're going to opt out for like the more denser stuff. And like now it becomes like sweet potato and um, things like that. But the, the hack to this, and so one thing that's kind of worked across the board, after dinner, get um, some vanilla protein mm-hmm. and some whole milk or even cream, and you whip it into a blender, into yeah. a, in a Vitamix, yep. and it turns into heavy cream yeah. that's so delicious, and you literally eat a bowl of heavy whipped cream, yep. and you put berries on it or granola, and you are going to add, you can easily, easily add a thousand to two thousand calories which is insane Mm -hmm. in that one extra meal per night and it is really tasty too it is i've done that we did that so this is probably more to miss but we did that once with our entire team during a get huge phase (laughs) and every single person gained 10 to 15 and is that like an like literally every night you do it or is it yeah Yeah, literally every night Uh, okay next question what are the best practices for improving mobility or flexibility what techniques and tools have you found effective what kind of time frame should we expect before seeing improvements um, I'm just gonna go really tactical here. Yeah. Yoga once a week. Okay. And it will take you depending the, the answer is where you start from. Exactly. Yeah. So if you start from a really stiff state, you should see improvements literally after one session. Now, if you're somewhere in between, it might be three, four, five weeks. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you're already flexible, you're probably not asking this question. Right. Um, and a type of yoga, I don't know enough. In yoga yeah. So to like, um, yeah, I, what I would do is for somebody that we've talked about this on the podcast yeah. before, but, um, my, my thing is like, chill stretchy yeah, yoga right. not holding poses forever not the strength yoga you're doing crossfit you're already getting got strong it. got it what uh was there more no okay just took a breath you're allowed to breathe um what's the training value or potential harm in wearing a weight vest for every class workout what about etiquette at what point should you just do the workout as written but faster okay so there's a lot of questions yeah now. but all, all coming around like should i wear a weight vest every day yeah kind of the answer is no Definitely, definitely not. So what are the advantages? Um, you're going to add some weight onto your gymnastics movements. If you're going to do weight vest when you're doing Linda, like which is three barbells, it yep. doesn't make a lot of sense. So definitely don't wear it for every workout. That's answer number one. Yep. Um, answer two is definitely don't wear it every day because you don't want to make things harder because you're going to get less reps and mm-hmm. some days should be a repetition day. Yeah. So if you're going to do Cindy five pull-ups, 10 push-ups, 15 squats, you wear a weight vest, you might get 12 rounds. Well, there's an advantage to that, sort of. You're really gonna, your heart rate is gonna come way down. Your intensity is gonna go way down. You're gonna get more strength benefit from it, potentially. The other side of that is you're gonna get 23 rounds without it. Okay, you're gonna get a lot more, vol- you'll be way sorer, so more muscle damage. Ache. In other words, you might get more benefit from muscle growth if you don't wear a weight vest. Right. The other way to say that is you don't wear a weight vest for most of your life. So you're gonna, you're gonna be training in this, f- f- um, um, different state than you're actually going to be where we we've done we've experimented with this we went through this phase that this person is right now where the thought was you know i'm one of those endurance guys i'm one of those metcon guys i need to get stronger i'm gonna do every workout with a weight vest Mm -hmm. you will not get as fit or as strong by doing that instead lift heavy when it's time to lift heavy and do your metcons if you're doing a weight vest workout like somebody that needs to do that maximum once a week yeah maximum now if you're a type of person that's training for um navy seals or long rucks that's totally different maybe it should be an everyday thing got it okay next question in your interview with julie fouché uh her podcast is pursuing health pursuing health i think in your interview with julie fouché you mentioned you don't think shooting is a good test of fitness and i'm curious why Okay, so um, we're going to test fitness. What we're going to test is the 10 components of fitness, which are endurance, strength, stamina, flexibility, speed, power, accuracy, agility, balance, and coordination. So what we want to do is create a breadth of tests across those 10 domains. If we're missing one of those domains, we're not testing the totality of fitness. So what we want to do is test things that have the greatest 
transference over as many as we can. That's why something like a workout with squat snatches, running, and um, pull-ups would be a great test. We're testing so many of those different things. If you're testing shooting, you're testing one thing, Mm -hmm. accuracy, Mm -hmm. and zero others. It's why deadlift is not as good of a test as something like um, a clean and jerk. Mm -hmm. You're testing strength, but you're also testing strength with a clean and jerk. In deadlift, you're just testing strength. In clean and jerk, you're also testing accuracy, balance, agility, coordination, um, speed, and power. It's like, you just gotta, if we had... A thousand tests? Yeah, let's put shooting in there. Right. We most of the time we don't have that when we're testing for the sport of fitness. Right. And there's also that that specific skill component to it too. Right. right? So it's like it's like the softball. What's the transfer, throw. Yeah. What's the transferability over to other things? Right. And you're gonna. We also don't want to do this. And Greg Glassman has said this early on: is like we don't want to necessarily do Fran because we have people that are awesome at Fran. We want to give things that people are not training. Yeah. So we see the variance of like the, the GPP aspect. Yeah. You test that, you, the shooters are going to do great and not. Now at the Rogue Invitational, they did biathlon. Mm-hmm. That's something different. So that's, can you settle your heart rate with mm-hmm. like, there's more tests there. Mm-hmm. It's not just shooting. Right. I think just shooting is not a good test. Mm. Putting shooting in with other things tests more things. Makes it more interesting. Got it. How much of the accomplishments of high-level CrossFit Games athletes can be attributed to the coach, and how much of it is virtuosity on the part of the athlete? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, no one knows. That's like, I don't know. Um, <laughs> you don't. You don't have a percentage for us. <laughs> like, I, so I, I guess maybe the question is: um, Do coaches have a major influence yeah. in the performance of athletes? Yeah. yeah, sure. It depends on the coach and depends on the athlete. If you have a really knowledgeable, really good coach with a really humble, really coachable athlete, of course. That's like, but it's not. Co- it's not the sport of CrossFit specific. It's not even athletics. Yeah. It's like any um, coach. It's a mentor-mentee relationship. And then the opposite is also true. If you have a crappy coach and a person that are, thinks that you already figured out, that's not going to move the needle probably at all. So this is just mentor-mentee relationship and how good is each party. The coaches in my box take turns programming each month, and one of them programmed a hero wad every single day for a month. Good idea or bad? Bad idea. Reminds me of the weight fest question. Yeah, it's a, it's the exact same <laughs> question. So what we need is one of the 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 tenets of what we're trying to create. If you want to create fitness mm-hmm. and you're trying to create high levels of fitness, there's varying degrees we could do that. We could go to uh, we could do um, like Barry's boot camp. Mm-hmm. We could do Zumba. We could do Orange Theory. Now the next level up from that, the next I'm gonna say it again. The next level up from that is CrossFit. Why? Because we're not constrained to the, the 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 format of the way those classes are set up. We have constant variance. They are also doing, arguably, functional movements and arguably high intensity movements. What they're not doing is the high level of variance that we are. They're not also doing just single modality stuff where they just go run a lot one day. They're also not doing. What I'm saying is you don't want to pigeon yourself into these long, brutal workouts for Which a number of different reasons. Are. Plus, like the recoverability of your athletes and all that. Aside, if you were recovering, you're still just creating a limited domain. Yeah. Um, follow up to that because part of that question was interesting to me. Just Which, by the some, way, we've done that as well. We have made all the mistakes. Yep. Yeah. I mean, um, the coaches taking turns programming. Any yeah. quick thoughts on the the uh, efficacy of that? Yeah, I um, I get it, but um, a month is. Um, may or may not be enough time to create a... So in in programming, this is going to be maybe like rabbit hole for some people. Yeah. There's these different like phases that they call them. And it's um, macro cycles, meso cycles, and micro cycles. And basically it just means the length of time we're thinking about our programming. Mm-hmm. So a macro cycle might be a year. It might be the length of time, a career for an athlete. Right. And then there's smaller cycles. And that might be... Um, um, off season, in season, it might be, um, something a little bit smaller, even month to month. And then there's micro cycles, which might be from like a week or two, or it might even be, um, like day to day. Mm -hmm. 
it's just kind of like, how are you thinking about things? And some people might think of this as like, no, we do month long chunks and that's where it all lives. In that case, okay. Mm -hmm. We think of things in terms of a year. And actually, um, it's even bigger than that for our athletes. It's literally, I think of it when I'm working with a lead athlete, it's it's the career of the athlete. What am I trying to do? It'd be ridiculous for me to think like, I have this athlete for a year and only this year. Like, you got to think what's next year and the year after that going to look like. Okay. Next question. Do you concern yourself with a member who decides to not renew his or her membership? Uh, do your, do you have admin staff let you know how many members leave each month or every few months? Okay. So I, this is something that I wish we were better at, but I know why we're not good at it. Yeah. Um, so it stems from my, um, my kind of like, uh, um, belief that people should do what they want to do. Mm-hmm. And my secondary belief that I don't like sales um, and that kind of like bias that I have. So I am not um, into chasing people down that leave the gym. Now, I am into communicating with our current members while they're still members and might not be showing up. Mm-hmm. That's something different. While they're not showing up, that's I care about you, I want you to be here. But once someone decides like, I don't want to be here, by the way, like, we could do better in terms of like having more members if we did this. It would work. Mm-hmm. Um, once somebody leaves, I was actually thinking about this this morning, or unrelated to this question, about just kind of like some names of people that popped up that haven't been here in a little while. Yeah. I'm like, man, it'd be cool to get them back. But the other side of me is like, dude, like they're adults and they decided not to be here. Like, right. I'm not going to like, I don't want to like, convince someone to come back we never run sales Mm -hmm. i don't want to reach out and be like we want you back the three month special yeah yeah. like but the other side of me is like dude you like these people like i wish that they were still here like they were your friends Mm -hmm. like so i'm conflicted yeah um the second part of the question is do people let me know when they're leaving yeah, because there are process in place. Um, yeah, though. there is but it's not as good as it should be and we could certainly be better at that but and just plainly stems back to those two biases that i have Mm -hmm. Um, but we do have a process for people that have, we call it, uh, the no show report. People Mm -hmm. that have not shown up in the last, um, uh, two weeks. Mm -hmm. And we have a secondary, secondary report called at risk members, which people that have only showed up twice, um, in a two week period. And we have protocols in place to, um, keep in contact with those people. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Last question we've got for today. How do you or your coaches deal with members who think that they are coaches? How do you handle someone with good intentions who is trying to coach another member but just doesn't have the knowledge? Yeah, so um, this is not a member trying to coach members issue. This is you Mm -hmm. issue and your coach's issue. What you're saying is I have members that are trying to help other members. What's the problem? Mm -hmm. Like, Dude, that's amazing. The issue is you are a level one coach. Level one coaches, and this could be hard for this person to hear. You're a level one coach and level one coaches lead in fear. It's the same question with like people like, I have other members getting their level one and now they are qualified and they're trying to help other members. What do I do? It's the same. You're leading in fear like Mm -hmm. because you, you only, your only qualification is basically you don't have full trust that you are coaching at a really, really high level. You don't have the full trust from your members who are going to go like, I hear what you're saying, other member. Let me just run that by Patrick. Mm -hmm. Like, There's nothing wrong with getting advice from anyone from anywhere. It should be happening all the time in every facet, inside the walls of the gym and outside. Level one leaders lead by position only. It's their title and they uh, lead in fear of other people coaching other people. What we need to do is become a level two, which is a relationship base. You have to build trust. Mm -hmm. You have to build trust with both both of those members. And that happens through building a relationship. Then from there, you have to deliver results. Level three, from there, you have to get personal results for that individual. And then only there do you get to be a pinnacle leader, which you basically seek, people seek you out for what you stand for. Mm -hmm. It's a level of the coach, not the members. Mm -hmm. You have to become a better coach. If you do, I promise you, that's not an issue. Do you think Greg Glassman's walking around going like, um, these people are not as qualified as I am to give um, nutritional and, um, uh, movement advice. Mm -hmm. So they should not go to other people. That's all that that's happening there. They should come to me. Got it. All right. Thank you to everybody who sends me questions. Thank you, Ben, for answering them. We will see everybody next week. See you next week. You can get every episode of chasing excellence, wherever you listen to your podcasts 
or on YouTube. Until next time, thank you for listening.